I'm a 27 year old girl, and even though this story happened almost 20 years ago, I still think back to it every year around this time. I was a 9 year old girl in grade 4 and it was Valentine's Day. We had spent the week decorating our class door for the yearly competition and making a big card for our principal and vice principal and other office staff signed by all of our class as our entry and an invitation to come see our theme decorated door. I don't remember how this part came about but I was the one to walk downstairs to the office and turn in our card. It was simple enough and I always look forward to getting out of the classroom even for a little while so I started to the office. Nothing spectacular happened on the way down or in the office. It was just a normal walk through the halls and down the stairs and then cheerfully turning in our class Valentine's Day card. I started down the same direction I came from but had chosen to go up a different set of stairs than the ones I had gone down. Now just some layout info for you. The school is a big rectangle with a large auditorium that had granite floors in the center. The second floor was a couple stories up and had an open balcony with a short railing overlooking the auditorium below. The classrooms bordered the lower and upper hallways, and all had windows facing outward. It is also a World War I historical building and can't be changed significantly or knocked down. Now back to the story, I was coming up and out of the stairwell and had started to walk towards my classroom, but I heard a whistle, one that sounded like a bird, and instinctively I turned around to see what it was. There was a boy sitting on the floor outside of one of the 6th grade classes. Kids were typically sent to sit outside the classroom as a mild punishment or to calm down. When I turned around to look, I met eyes with the boy and he had some kind of smirk on his face. Before I could turn around to start walking, this kid says, Ooga booga. Uh, what? Seriously? I just giggled then turned around to get back to class. A few seconds later, I was being pushed up against the short railing looking over the auditorium far down below. He pushed and pushed and it was quite a struggle. I won't pretend like it was easy for me as a little girl, but I managed to get a kick right where it matters, if you know what I mean. The boy dropped and I ran crying back to the classroom. I don't remember much of the events that followed immediately afterward. I really think I was in shock. However, I know exactly how it all turned out. My mom was angry beyond words. I am her only child and it took her five years to have me, so needless to say she was livid at the idea of losing me. My mom threatened lawsuits and going to the local news and newspaper. It turns out the kid had many behavioral, mental, and learning disabilities and his parents had not given him the correct medication or attention that he required. It was a long argument that went on for weeks, but in the end my mom did have sympathy for the boy who was clearly not being given the care he needed. She did not however have sympathy for his parents who she saw as responsible. My mom settled for having the boy removed from the school district and having the school put in taller railings so this might not happen again to someone else. But the story doesn't end here. After this event my mom was ultra paranoid and signed her little ballerina up for karate. I was not thrilled about this and my thought was, I defended myself just fine so why do I need karate? Anyways, when I showed up for the first class, you want to know who I saw in the room? Yep, it was the boy who tried to push me over the railings. I pointed him out to my mom and she was in 100 miles per hour crazy mommy mode all over again. After my mom explained what the boy had done to the owner instructor, the boy's mom was told she could no longer bring him to the class there, and they were to leave immediately. His mom got mad at me, of all people. Why she misdirected her anger, I will never know. Her child could have ended my life or seriously injured me at the very least, and it was due to her negligence and her son's behavior. As much as I know it was due to his very unfortunate circumstances, it doesn't make it okay. It doesn't make me feel safe to be in the same room as him, and I also don't know why she thought it would be appropriate for a child who was shown he can and will use violence to be taking martial arts. Therapy would have been the more logical route in my opinion. After that, I didn't stay in karate long, as I was always a girly girl more interested in dance and Barbie dolls. All these years later, I still think back to that day. I wonder what became of that boy. I wonder if he got the help he needed. 
I wonder if he remembers, and sometimes I even ask myself if it was all a dream. But it wasn't a dream. It was something I will always remember, and I learned many lessons that day. The biggest being, always be aware of your surroundings. My friends and I used to urbex a lot. For those who may not know, urbex means urban exploring, which is exploring abandoned places. We did it a lot. Literally any opportunity we had to go, we did. This one weekend was different though. It was on a Friday night and my friend DJ called me excited about this place he found about 45 minutes away. At that time I was with this girl I really liked, Miranda. She'd never been able to go with us, but this time she was and was super excited. So we packed a couple of backpacks with the essentials, flashlights, face masks, small first aid kits, all that. DJ picked us up around 6pm along with three other friends, Matt, Jesse, and my good friend Babs. It was a 45 minute drive and on the way there, DJ explained where we were going. Apparently there was a small abandoned neighborhood in the mountains. We followed the instructions that DJ's coworker sent him. Turn right at the fork in the road, drive straight through until you come up to a patchy spot on the left, park there, and walk until you come to a gate. Step over it and just keep walking until you come up to an arch. That's how you know you're in the neighborhood. Altogether, it was a 40-minute walk, which surprisingly didn't wear us out because we were so excited. We finally find the arch and pass through it, and what we saw was a legit neighborhood. There were old houses everywhere. You couldn't even see where the roads divided. We started going to some of them. One of them had a children's room where clothes were still hanging up, and judging from that, this neighborhood was from the 20s or 30s. Eventually, we lost track of time and it was dark. I mean, the type of darkness that hurt your eyes because they can't adjust to it. At that point, it was almost 11 p.m. and we didn't want to make the 40-minute walk back and drive another 45 minutes back home. We had no choice to spend the night in one of the houses. We found one, though. Babs had a bunch of blankets with her, so we decided to sleep on them. I got the biggest one for Miranda and me to sleep on, and within a minute, we were all fast asleep. I woke up... I'd say at around 3 a.m., to this overwhelming sense of dread. Miranda was awake too, asking me if I felt that too. I asked her how long she'd been up. Like an hour, I got to get water from my backpack and I felt something watching me. Instantly, I felt uneasy. Miranda dug through her bag, got out a lighter and we lit what was left of the fireplace. Come to find out, everyone else was up too. DJ sat up and was like, Yeah, earlier I went up to take a pee and when I turned around, something walked by the doorway. Just as he finished saying that, Jesse comes running in like a bull through a china shop. She stopped to catch her breath. There, there's someone buried here. We all looked at her like she was insane. O okay, fine, follow me then. She takes off out the back door. She was right. Right there in the backyard was someone's decrepit wooden grave marker. Bab starts freaking out. Guys, look at the dirt. Someone wasn't buried here. Someone was dug up here. Needless to say, we got out of there quick. We all ran back to the house and started to pack everything up. Then, that back door just slammed clean off its hinges. There was a point where we all froze and listened. We heard footsteps, shuffling, and the creepiest of all, what sounded like someone taking a brush through long hair. After that, we only grabbed our wallets and keys and ran out. All of our stuff is still there. The blankets, backpacks with flashlights and first aid kits in them. I think Jessie left her camera behind too. And the fact that someone dug up a body in their backyard gives me the creeps to this day. Sometimes I get the urge to find that place again and see if our stuff is still there, but the thought of having to feel that nauseating dread again makes me think twice. A 
About two years ago, I was working at a large corporate restaurant that I shall not name. There was a guy there, Blake, that I worked with. He wasn't necessarily attractive in the conventional sense. He was tall and super skinny, but had blue eyes and liked to laugh when we talked. I started falling for him. Well, he apparently liked me too. So we made plans to hang out and smoke some, watch some TV, etc. Well, the day came and we didn't actually smoke, as we both thought that the other was going to have it. But we did end up fooling around. It was fun and it was sweet as he was extremely kind and caring to me. But afterwards, he changed. Suddenly he wouldn't talk to me or even look at me. He was just sitting on the floor staring at the TV. When I told him I was leaving for work and that I'd be back later for my stuff, he just shrugged. Later I texted him to ask him if he was okay and this was the response I got. He is fine. Maybe not your idea of okay, but he is. When I asked who it was, I was introduced to Styx, the supposed alternate personality of Blake. I don't remember everything that was said between Styx and I, but the gist of it was that he was the only reason Blake was still alive, as Blake was depressed and Styx was the protective personality. This was right after the movie Split came out, so I figured, okay, maybe he legitimately had something happen to him that caused him to develop a personality. I told him I would come back to get my stuff, and I was told not to come anywhere near the house. I didn't listen. After work, I went right back and knocked on the door. There was a light on in the house somewhere. As I stood there, I texted him to ask him to come open the door so I could check on Blake and get my stuff and leave. The light went out, making it completely dark. I spent two hours trying to get him to let me in. Finally, I warned him. If he didn't let me in, I would break in the door. Suffice to say, I seemed to have no sense of self-preservation. I broke in. Now, looking back, I really should have called the cops to report a possibly mental unstable person holding my stuff hostage. Instead, I entered the house, completely dark, took off my slick sole shoes, my restrictive jacket just in case something did happen. I had pepper spray in one hand and a self-defense punching tool with two spikes on the other. I called out, saying that I was coming in and to please not attack me. My dumb self didn't clear the room as I went. He came out from the bathroom as I passed, grabbing me from behind, forcing my face up by my chin with one hand and pressing something against my throat with the other. I couldn't breathe. I was choking on my tongue from the way he was holding me. I panicked. I lashed out with my defense tools a few times. He shook me like a doll. Stop attacking me, he hissed. I told you to leave. I held my hands up forcing words past my held jaw. I pleaded with him to let me go, that I'd leave, I just wanted my stuff. Eventually he started moving towards the door, dragging me. He threw me out and shut the door. I was barefoot, in the wet, with no jacket, keys, or phone. I beat on the door, telling him to give me my stuff so I could go home. He actually threw them out through the cracked door. All but my jacket... I returned to my car with a message that he had put my stuff in the trunk of his car and it was open for me. It wasn't all there and I told him that. On the way home, I was shocked that he continued to message me. Except this time, instead of warning me, he was telling me that while he held me up, he was thinking of all the ways he could get rid of me and my car. That supposedly, he thought that cooking me up would be the easiest way to get rid of the evidence. I learned more about the human psyche than all my college classes and all the documentaries that could have prepared me for this. Now at this point I should have gone to the police but I had just broken into his house and I figured that they would see him as defending himself. I went to work the next morning with a bruise from his hand on my chin and a scratch on my neck. We only talked once after that. I asked him to bring the rest of my stuff to the place we worked. I told my manager about everything and she did sympathize with me. She was worried because working with him gave me severe anxiety. Then, one day I walked into the fridge to grab a pre-made salad and found a nasty wilted brown lettuce and moldy tomatoes. Sometimes we got icky tomatoes in with the good ones, we just threw them out and cleaned the good ones. And every salad was wrapped in plastic wrap. 
Each one had a message on them. The first one I found was telling me to go end my life, and the other said things like, I spit in this salad, and for me to go off and jump in a fire. We found out by handwriting, timing, and cameras that it was Blake. He was promptly fired. As he walked out, he punched a window outside the dining room hard enough to crack it. It was thick glass. The only reason I'm putting this up is because he recently tried to get in contact with me over Facebook. He said he wanted to apologize, and I told him in some not-so-nice words to leave me alone. And that's the story of how I narrowly escaped with my life. I just got back from staying in San Diego. I had a great time with family. This experience was just so surreal to me. I can't shake the image out of my head. I came down to visit my grandparents. They are the closest people I know by the airport. Even then, they are still 45 miles away. My flight was for 4 a.m., so I left at 2. I knew I wanted to go through security fast and look around. I was about 20 minutes into the trip when I got to Pleasant Grove. I was driving past the post office and looked at the school. Then I stopped, dead in my tracks. There was a man standing in front of the school. I couldn't see his face. He was wearing a horror cliche outfit, a black hoodie, black pants, and tilting his head. I looked at him in horror, frozen. My instincts told me to drive off, but I wanted to ask if he was okay. I picked up my phone and he was gone. Nope, I whispered and drove off. I was driving and all of a sudden he ran in front of my car. I swerved to the side. Now I could see his face. I could see his nose and his smile. He tilted his head again. I backed up and drove off. On my flight, I just kept thinking, what was that guy doing? Was he some kid trying to be creepy or an actual creep? So, in the rest of my time on this earth, I hope I never see this freak again. I am a 15-year-old girl who has always been interested in true crime, paranormal activity, and real-life monsters, so when I went to spend a weekend with my aunt and she offered to tell me about their house gremlin, I was interested. She explained this creature to be friendly, harmless, and a playful thing. This made sense to me because I had never felt anything harmful in her house. She told me that she would be doing basic things like taking out the garbage and would see a short gremlin-like creature peek from around the corner, and when she would go to look, it would be gone. The gremlin would also take things like when she would set down her keys, walk away and come back, only to find them gone and she knew what happened. After something went missing, she would look and usually not find anything. She told me all she had to do was ask and call out to it, I know you took my stuff and I want it back. And shortly after, it would be in the same spot that it went missing from. At first, it sounded crazy to me and I didn't believe and I think it knew that I doubted it. As the weekend progresses and was coming to the end, I really wanted proof of something being out there. It was Sunday morning and we were sitting at the dining room table. My aunt was sitting on her computer and went to log into her Facebook but couldn't remember the password. This is normal for my aunt as she has a lot of different accounts and passwords for different things. Now my aunt is old school and writes everything down in her Rolodex which is basically a little card box full of little note cards to write down information. My aunt reached over to where it usually sits and couldn't find it. She stood up and started looking for it and as she was looking, I told her that I wanted to see the gremlin before I left. She looked at me and said, well, This is it honey, now please help me look. I got up from my chair and walked away from the table, and as I did this, my aunt looked at where I was sitting and yelled out, Oh wow, and I asked if she had found it. With a quick glance at where she was standing, I realized that right in front of my seat, the Rolodex was just sitting there. This was proof enough for me as I knew it was not there before. I sat down in complete shock. 
Ever since that day, I don't doubt that creature anymore, and he has not messed with me or my stuff again. I have just recently discovered this subreddit and do have other paranormal stories unrelated to the gremlin that I will be posting here soon. These stories have more to do with an evil or unpleasant spirit that has followed me. If people enjoyed this, I might think about posting that here as well. This story is the most horrific incident I've ever been in. My name is Katrina. I was 22 when this happened. I used to work in the Eaton Center in Toronto part-time, as did my sister, Tanya. She worked at Hallmark and I worked in a toy store. I went into work like any normal day, helping customers purchase their items, sweeping the floors and just making sure all the toys were placed neatly. By the time I knew it, it was lunchtime. I remember not feeling very hungry that day, so I decided to get some popcorn. After I paid for my popcorn and opened the bag about to indulge, I heard what I can only describe as a bunch of balloons popping. Almost instantly I heard a few people scream and cry. No sooner after that did I hear the sound of people running. I was on the third floor of the mall and in the middle was a glass barrier that allows you to look down to the bottom level of the mall, aka the food court. I threw my head over the glass barrier and looked around and to the far right of where I was, I see a man's body in a pool of blood. It felt like my heart stopped. I backed away from the glass barrier and ran back to my store making my way through people that were running for their lives. I got to my store and told my manager that someone was shot and that we needed to lock up. I remember my manager telling me to get everyone out of the store and I hate to mention this but my manager made me send away a boy who was no more than 8 years old. As I went to escort the boy out of the store, still trembling, I saw two women running almost side by side screaming that he's got a gun. I heard a loud pop and I fell to the ground in terror. My manager threw the security gate down and screamed out, and he hit the ground just as I did. Another loud pop echoed through the store. He told me and my two co-workers to stay down and get to the back room. We crawled to the back room and he locked the door. I took my phone out of my back pocket and dialed my sister's number as I had feared she was working today. My sister answered and I asked if she was working. She told me no. Then it hit me. I was stuck in the mall with some lunatic with a gun that just killed someone. I told my sister about the situation my sister was over at my house with one of my roommates and my boyfriend. My roommate called the police and relayed what I was saying to my sister. My sister then told me that she was going to get our roommate Matt to come pick them up and take them down to get me. I told them I loved them and told my sister that if I didn't make it out, to tell my parents, brother, and boyfriend that I loved them. After I hung my cell phone up, I started to cry. I was sure that this was the day I was going to die. We waited in the back room for what felt like hours. My hands were clammy. I hardly had a voice from crying and I remember feeling hot. I'd say about 15 to 20 minutes passed when I heard a sound over the speaker telling everyone else in the mall to evacuate. I picked up my purse and we started to run out the back. No sooner did we reveal ourselves from the back room, a few police officers had their guns pointed at us. When they saw that I was upset and that we were still in our uniforms, they told us to hurry and to get out. As I made my way to the escalator, I looked around to see a grim sight. About 8 to 12 strollers were left by the Queen Street doors with babies still in them. I held my hand up to my mouth in shock and continued to run out the doors. I made it to the top of the escalator and a few news report teams started to shove microphones into my face. I remember screaming at them to get out of my way. As soon as I got outside, I saw my boyfriend and my heart sank. I fell to the ground and started to cry. My boyfriend picked me up and started to hug and kiss me, telling me I was safe. I stuffed my head into his chest and cried. A man asked me for an interview and my boyfriend pushed him away. We went to Tim Hortons and grabbed a cup of water and slugged it back. Not saying much to anyone, Matt drove us all home. The following day I spoke to a private investigator who wanted me to go down to her office to interview about what happened that day. 
I couldn't do it. I was terrified to leave the house. I'd let her record me and use it if they ever found the person. A few weeks later, a man by the name of Christopher Husbands admitted to the crime. He ended the life of two people, on top of which a pregnant woman was trampled over as people were trying to escape and a 13-year-old boy was shot in the head too. Luckily, he survived. I now have a fear of crowds and have nightmares of seeing this man's body. It still disturbs me to this day. June 2nd, 2012 is a day I can never forget. When I was 10, my mom's sister and I went to a family function on my mom's side. We came home that night in March, around 10pm or so. My dad was intoxicated. He went to a bar out of town with a couple of co-workers before. My mom told me to go to bed five different times, but being the stubborn kid I was, I didn't listen. Pretty soon, my dad was upset that I wasn't listening, and this set him into a terrible ranting mood. He called my mom's sisters every name under the sun, insulted everything about them, all the while my mom begged him to stop. Eventually, I ran to my room and tried to fall asleep. This is where things get hazy, but around 30 minutes later I heard a loud crack and a bang. My dad kicked a hole beneath a window in our wall. I stormed down the hallway into his room and ripped the closet doors off their hinges. I remember listening to him pack a bag while screaming with my mom. He came into my room, turning on the light and demanding confused and scared me to get up and get in the truck. He wanted to take me somewhere. My mom obviously objected and I stayed put while the banter went back and forth even more so. He stormed out of the house, got in the truck at midnight and drove away. My mom called the cops and a police officer I met earlier due to a school function was in the living room 30 minutes later. My dad was apparently at his parents a mile out of town and I stood in the hallway and watched the officer talk with my mom. My mother came down the hall and told me I could stay up and play my DS if I wanted to. I drowned out the sounds of the cops radio and my mom's sobs with new Super Mario Brothers. I still remember which levels I was playing on. My dad's mom showed up at around 1am and she slept on our couch that night. I crawled into bed with my mom at 2am. Around 5am I woke up to my dad crawling into bed, reeking like booze and cigarettes. This would be the only time I'd heard him cry. He sobbed as he held me, apologizing over and over again. Over the next few months things got better. My parents are still married to this day and are much happier now. We've never talked about this incident, but it has forever changed me. The worst, yet best part, my sister slept through everything and has no idea what happened. The story took place when I was an 11-year-old girl. A bit of backstory. My siblings and I grew up in a small town with a population of maybe 800 people. We lived two houses away from a Catholic church and a graveyard. One day in the year 2000, my parents sent my little sister and I to the store with a note for the family-owned gas station owner named Kayla to be able to sell us packs of smokes for my dad. We arrived to the store in about 10 minutes. We were counting out the bills and changed to see if we had enough money for some surprise candy bags, and we did. My sister and I grabbed two surprise bags and a pack of my dad's favorite cigarettes. We paid for everything and left the store. My sister and I were talking when I turned my head and saw a man. Not a normal looking man. This man looked like he had just walked out of the hospital. He looked to be in his 70s. He had a walker, an oxygen tank, two bags attached to the walker with red and white liquid in it. He had tubes up to his nose and a tube down his mouth and was slowly trying to walk with the help of his walker. With each step he took, I heard him gasp. I turned to my sister while pointing my finger in the direction of the man and said, Look. My little sister turned and she saw the man too. My sister turned to me after examining him and said, That poor guy. We both turned back in his direction and he was gone. 
There's no way that an old man with all that equipment and that condition that he was in could easily run somewhere to hide. My sister and I were confused. We returned home shaken up and our parents noticed it immediately. My mom asked me what was wrong. I told her the story and my mom believes that he was a ghost. Four days later, my sister and I were playing outside in the yard and saw a bunch of cars driving away from the church. We ran to see what was happening. All we saw were people crying and wearing black dresses. Later that day, we asked our dad if we could go out for a walk. My dad agreed and off my sister and I went. I told my sister it was more than likely a funeral as we went walking in the graveyard to investigate. To the very far left of the graveyard... We saw a fresh grave that was dug up and then covered again. I ran to see the picture of the tombstone and my heart dropped into my stomach. It was the man that we had seen walking four days earlier. I was stunned. I looked at the date on the stone. He was born in 1941 and he had died five days ago. I grabbed my sister by the hand and we ran back home and I told her not to say anything to our parents. Life continued on normally from then on. We never saw the dead man again. About six years ago, me and my sister were asked to join our parents for a family holiday to Greece. My sister and I were, at the time, 19 and 23 years old. We had not been on a family vacation, just us, for about four years and we kind of missed just doing something together as a family. We always traveled with our parents and other family members when we were younger so we figured it was about time. We were pretty excited to go to Greece. For me and my sister it was new. We had never been to Greece but our parents had been there the year before but now a new town and a new hotel. Usually my parents always travel to the same hotels and the same cities. They weren't really that adventurous and preferred just traveling somewhere beautiful and calm to enjoy the beaches and food. Nothing more really, as for my sister and I, we usually preferred doing more than just hanging at the beach all day, but we both figured it would be cozy either way. So, this is how our creepy family vacation starts. We had finally arrived at the airport in Greece, traveling from Norway, which was not that long. I think it took around five with plane. We landed early in the morning in Greece. Everything was so beautiful and different from home. We were really excited. Two hours later, my family and I had arrived at the hotel. It really was beautiful. We usually always traveled to nice hotels. Not that my family is rich or anything like that, but they're not poor either, and we always preferred safe and secure hotels. So this looked really nice. We had separate hotel rooms from our parents, since we were adults here. Me and my sister shared an okay size hotel room next door were my parents. We actually had a door in the hotel leading into their bedroom, but we kept it locked. At first, my little sister was a little bothered by the door since she felt we didn't have enough private space separating our two bedrooms. We didn't think much about it and went to sleep. So we wake up. It's day one of our vacation. I think we were there for about 13 or 14 days and the first week or so went alright. We didn't really do much, just stayed at our hotel room, went out to the pool or beach which was 4 minutes away, walking distance, and then we ate lunch and went back to the beach. Went for a jog or a walk at the beach. There were a lot of people there but not as many as that we were used to from earlier vacations. The weather was really great and it was warm every single day. So every day was pretty much the same but it didn't really get boring. Me and my family always had a lot to talk about and we rarely fight. Usually my parents fight or have a couple of discussions with each other but this time it was actually none that I can remember. So a few days later me and my sister decide to stay down in the hotel lobby where we just sat on the sofa talking and playing a few games online on our phones. Suddenly my sister pinches my arm, looking me straight in the eyes. There was something off about how she looked at me. I could tell she wasn't joking. She slowly moved her head to the left, letting me know where to look, so I turned to her direction, yet to turn back, asking her, What? Was I supposed to see something? She nodded. Did you really not see? I just turned around once more, looking a bit confused, asking, Okay, I'm confused. What do you want me to see? 
She explained with a low voice that a man was standing around 30 meters away looking our direction, pretending to read something, but she had noticed that he had not one time had flipped the page on the newspaper he was reading, which she definitely found strange. She had met his eyes and stares without him really staring away. I wasn't sure what to think. I definitely knew she wasn't lying, and there was something weird about this guy. But I didn't really know what to say or what to think. It wasn't like he had done something wrong, or said something, so, so I just kind of brushed it off. Trying to tell her he was probably just weird or had been drinking. And it wasn't even that late. I actually don't think that he would even have time to have been drinking. He just kept staring. I told her that we should probably just go up to our hotel room, get some sleep before going to the beach tomorrow. We got up to our room, feeling a little silly and paranoid, looking backwards all the time till we got up safe in our hotel room. We both grew up learning and hearing all kinds of things about humans, strangers, and creepers out in the world and kind of had all that stuff imprinted into our minds. We also were really into scaring each other in horror movies. Every time we had a film night or were on a vacation, we traveled with at least one laptop to be able to pick our own scary movies to watch, and tonight was one of those nights. We both wanted to watch a movie and decided to watch Vacancy, which is a pretty scary movie to watch. Usually we went for the old classics, but we decided to watch something newer. We were both a sucker for the old ones. The movie was now over and we were ready to go to sleep. We were both tired and promised our parents to join them at the beach early in the morning. They were always up at around 7am and we usually went down to meet them at the beach at around 11 or noon. So we wake up at 7am and decide to sleep a little longer, setting the clock to around 9am or 10am. We both wake up, change into our bikinis and pack our bags. We took the elevator down to the first floor. We were staying in the fifth floor so it didn't take long to make it down. We were both hungry and went to the small food store the hotel had on the first floor. As we entered the store, we could see the creeper from last night, just standing behind some postcards, just holding one up. My sister looks at me with a big, oh, not this guy again. We both turn around and walk away, looking behind my back one last time as my eyes meets his, and he smiles. It's a creepy long smile, which really felt super weird. I don't know why, but it was like an alarm went off inside of me. My guts were definitely telling me that this guy was up to no good. I grabbed my sister's arm and told her he gave me a creepy smile. She turns around and looks to see if he's following us. We don't see him. So we walk outside the hotel, and we're surrounded by other hotels everywhere, and we keep turning our heads. But we felt pretty safe going outside down the road and down to the beach. Pretty much families everywhere you look with kids and cars passing. Surely everyone here can't be crazy, we think to ourselves. We arrive at the beach in time for lunch with our parents. They laugh and let us know that they knew we weren't able to make it at 7am. We didn't really laugh back and I decided to tell my mom about the creepy guy from the other day and just now. She's a really paranoid woman and told us to stay close to them and no longer walk alone. We both agreed and felt much safer that way anyway. We didn't even know if the creeper guy actually was a bad guy or had even followed us, but we just went with our gut feeling. It made me feel really young again, staying close to my parents like a little child, but I figured I'd rather get home safe feeling like a child than perhaps not getting home at all. So the day went on like the other days, nothing really bad happened. We went out for dinner later that night, then went back to the hotel lobby, then to bed. The next day was pretty much the same. We went down the lobby early in the morning. The creepy guy appeared once again, but not with a new guy. He was a bit younger, but I couldn't tell his age. And I now figured that they were Greek or from here, from the way they talked and looked. They looked like they could be from Russia or Poland, the sort of Eastern European descendants. His friend was wearing some really old, weird biker sunnies, which looked rather weird, and they both had really tight shorts on. I figured the creeper was around mid or late 40s and the younger guy was in his late 20s or early 30s. As me and my sister made my parents aware of the creeper, they both turned around and looked and said they looked weird. My dad didn't really say much other than, yeah, they look weird, but I'm sure they're just looking for some fun or something like that. So we walked down to the beach, me and my sister, while our mom was on the toilet and my dad was waiting for her. She never locks the door, so he always has to wait for her. 
me and my sister just decided to walk ahead. Suddenly the two guys were right behind us, laughing and whistling at us. We couldn't really hear what they were saying or understand a word, they both just kept on laughing. We started to walk faster and were finally at the beach. We put our towels down and saw our parents walking towards us. The two guys suddenly put both their towels and belongings right beside us. I kid you not, only two or three meters they were away from us. This really gave us the chills, especially since there were a lot of empty spaces to lay down at the beach on this particular day. This whole situation was just getting odd. What did they want? We never talked. We never showed any kind of interest or even smiled back. And they kept coming back or closer to us. It was obvious we weren't interested in anything they wanted. The whole day at the beach was very weird. The entire time they kept looking at us and staring then holding their phones up. I could swear a couple of times it was like they were trying to take photos, but they didn't do it too obvious so we couldn't really say anything. Finally, we had had enough. My mom and dad gave them a horrible stare back, like, like, don't even look at our daughters kind of look. They stopped laughing and acting like teenagers and got very serious as we walked away, but we didn't care. The day passed and we didn't see them, so we slowly thought to ourselves that perhaps they got the point now and that we weren't interested in anything that they wanted to ask or do. After that, we had a whole day of not running into those creeps. We finally got our holiday spirit back, but we felt more calm. My dad even joked that perhaps they had left the hotel and back to their country. Later that night, after we went out to dinner, my mom felt really sick and had to go lay down and decided to sleep early. My dad sat down with my sister and I for a few hours, talking and walking around looking at the hotel and a few other hotels down the street. We decided to buy some groceries for later and make some food in our hotel room. My dad told us that he wanted to go and check on our mom to see if she was feeling any better, and if she wasn't, he was just going to watch the TV in their room anyways. I'm pretty sure there was some football match on and he didn't want to miss. Me and my sister stayed down in the hotel lobby for a few hours. We started talking to some Swedish tourists, just small talk. Suddenly the creeper appeared again. So yet again we were met with intense weird stares. My sister is usually a very outspoken person and probably wouldn't mind asking him what he wanted or why he was always staring at us. I'm more quiet, not afraid or letting some people know how I feel, but I'm just more quiet and a calm person rather than my sister. But we both kept our mouths shut, trying to ignore the guy who always appeared. We figured our vacation was almost over anyways, so what could possibly go wrong? We weren't even alone. He kept hiding behind a newspaper, but we could tell he was looking and staring us down. My sister wanted to go upstairs, but we were both a little hesitant on how we would play this one out. If we were to stand up and leave, would this creepy stalker guy follow us? Would he just sit there and not do anything? Anyways, I thought to myself that we're at a hotel that seems fully booked. That means people everywhere. Almost every corner of my eye, I could see someone. So I said to my sister, Hey, it's getting late. Let's go upstairs and watch a movie or something. She agreed and we walked towards the elevator and entered. The elevator was just standing still, no movement whatsoever. We decided just to walk the stairs. We were on the stairs to the third or fourth floor when I hear the elevator opening. I got this really weird feeling. A feeling of fear I had never experienced and I've experienced a lot of fear in my life. But this was something totally different. I saw the creeper standing still in the elevator. I recognized his clothes. I didn't see his face. Just the shape of his head or arm in a shadow. He was wearing a Hawaiian shirt and some oversized shorts. This was the really creepy part. Instead of walking outside where his elevator had stopped, the man just stood there. Me and my sister both froze. Like, do we run? Do we wait? And see if he re-enters here. What do we do? He pokes his head out, looking towards the stairs. Before he can even meet my scared look, me and my sister ran upstairs and kept running, not looking behind us. My sister tells me while running that she thought that she saw him running after us. We finally arrive outside our hotel room, opening it and shutting it as fast as we could. Before I entered the room, I made sure just to stop and look if the man was after us. I swear once we arrived at the fifth floor where we were staying, not once did I see the man or hear anyone. 
so it would pretty much be impossible for him to see which door was ours. There must have been at least 20 different rooms on the fifth floor. My sister was at this point very scared and not sure what to think about what had just happened. I made sure to tell her he didn't see where he had entered. At this point I was just grateful that we weren't completely alone. My parents were sleeping only a door away. My sister and I stayed up and talked for a while and agreed to not wake our parents up until the next day and let them know what had just happened. We decided to sleep and not think any further into it. This is much easier said than done. Well, it must have been around 3 in the morning when we were woken up to a knock on the door. We both stared at each other, terrorized to what just happened and which door to look at. We were 100% sure that the knock wasn't coming from our mom and dad's door, and there was no way my mom or dad would have left without telling us that knock at our door at 3 in the morning. They would have entered the door from their room to ours, so this is definitely the most scary part of the story so far. Suddenly I hear a second knock. I'm completely shattered and beyond able to move from the bed. Looking directly over at my sister as she sits still and awaits for another knock, I'm not sure if I heard any sounds outside the door, neither did I want to hear any or walk any closer to the door. We both just sat still. I look my sister in the eye, telling her, I'm not opening that door, neither are you. I think we have to wake dad up now. I can't do this anymore. She nods, and as we slowly move towards the door, where my parents were sleeping, I can hear a final knock a little louder than before, and suddenly I could hear my dad's voice. He had gotten out of his bed and opened the front door to his hotel room, where he looked at the creeper who stood outside me in my sister's hotel room. I was completely in shock. I can't even remember what he said or what my mom did or if she was still asleep. I can only remember what they told me and that I could see the man's shadow while talking to my dad in his boxers. I didn't even want to see him or hear why he was knocking at the door in the three in the morning and how he knew where we stayed. I'd never been so frustrated and scared at the same time in my entire life. I remember my dad talking to him, a very short conversation before shutting the door, and presumably the creeper left us and went somewhere hopefully far away. My dad told me and my sister that he could easily see that when he opened it, it was in fact that same creeper, and how shocked the man was to see my dad standing in front of him instead of me or my sister. It was like he wasn't expecting that at all, and even had a backup story for why he was following us and knocking at the door. I think my dad said with an angry loud voice, with his terrible Norwegian English, Why are you following my daughters and knocking at the door this time? What could you possibly want? The man was just standing there, taking a few steps back from my dad and staring down at the floor, looking away and never actually looking my dad in the eyes, just answering with his really poor English. I don't know, uh, maybe wrong door. Just mumbling on and on about the door and knocking, but not a single word he said made any sense. He couldn't even finish his sentences properly. We all went to bed, just exhausted and tired, just ready to go home and let this nightmare be over. We kept the doors in between, open the entire night. The next day we went down in the hotel lobby, talking with the hotel manager about what had happened. My parents were very angry and frustrated that he knew our hotel room. The hotel staff looked really weird at each other and didn't really talk much. They simply apologized and made sure this wouldn't happen again, and that they would try to find out who the man was. My mom started rambling on and on about human trafficking and all the stories she's heard, read, and seen on TV. We were all thinking about what a terrible place this was. The staff didn't really seem surprised or scared at all. It was like this was something that happened a lot. The next day, with no encounters with the creeper, we arrived at the hotel, finished at the beach for the day, security guards at the hotel was holding the creeper in his arm, throwing him out of the hotel. We couldn't hear what they were saying, we just stood there, watching as he was thrown out and far away from us, thankfully. We went straight up down to the front desk at the reception asking what just happened. They gave us a very simple explanation of what had just occurred. Well, you see, we are really sorry to inform you, but the man never booked in or stayed at our hotel. He was never a guest in our hotel or in any hotels close by. They simply had no idea how he had gotten into the hotel and how he was able to come and go as he pleased. 
The woman at the front desk talked with a calming voice to let us know that it was all taken care of now, and that we should be able to enjoy our final days and have a good vacation. We were all in shock and freaked out. What was this guy's intentions? One thing was we were all certain of was that this man certainly wasn't up to any good, and what could have happened if we were there alone, just two girls? The scary part was, a day after arriving home, I got a strange text on my phone from a foreign unknown number telling me that they missed me and my sister or wondered how we were and that he couldn't get us out of his mind and how he hoped that we could meet up again. He also wrote something like, from the hotel guy or sincerely Mr. Crete, since my family and I had vacationed in Crete, Greece. I was obviously terrified and a little scared out of my mind. I was at my parents' home and I remember reading it, taking a screenshot before running down the stairs to my parents showing them the text. They were all shocked and told me to block the number, and it didn't take long before I got a text from one of my friends letting me know that it was only her that had sent the message to mess with my mind. I was pretty upset, but eventually I laughed at it. Luckily, I've never heard anything from that guy and hopefully he never got my number. After this episode, I must admit, traveling all over isn't really something I must do anymore. I really wanted to travel to new places and experience new cultures and see the world, but there's so many things in this world that want to harm you and scare you. One thing I'm very sure of is that never ever will I travel alone to a foreign country. I'm even scared and a little paranoid taking the train out of town in my own homeland. I've had quite a few paranormal experiences in my life, but this one has to be the most terrifying. Some background information on me. I'm 16 years old as of writing this. I've been diagnosed with severe mental disorders and I tend to be skeptic. Many people don't believe in the paranormal and would probably say that my experiences are due to my mental disorders. I myself have wondered that as well, however, I came to the conclusion that there's no connection. I have been diagnosed with PTSD due to an abusive father, anxiety, and depression. While I do have nightmares, which is common with people who have PTSD, I have never had nightmares that included the paranormal, and I have never hallucinated, at least to my knowledge. This happened almost two years ago. I had a small dog at the time named Holly. She was a border collie, Australian shepherd mix who was mistreated by her old family and had some aggression issues we were working on. My room was pretty small. It was on the second floor with a window and a walk-in closet. I had my bed under the window that was straight across from my bedroom door in my closet. I have never liked that closet and would always get a bad feeling. I could never leave the door open, especially at night. Me and my mom felt like the whole house was haunted due to several reasons. My dog Holly would go insane, barking and growling at the door to the garage and my closet when no one was in there or standing back there. My lights would keep flickering and both me and my mother had bad feelings about the house. I've seen a few things in the living room and both me and my mother have heard things. One night I was lying in bed facing the window. Holly was laying at the end by my feet. I had all the doors closed and lights off. As I was drifting off, I heard Holly start growling. Thinking she was growling at someone outside, I told her to quit and lay down. She didn't and actually started growling louder. I turned and started to prop my body up so I could look and see what was outside. I noticed Holly was facing the window, but my door. She was kind of crouched down at the edge of the bed, teeth bared, hair standing up, ears pinned back. Weirded out, I turned all the way over and froze. I saw a dark figure hunched over staring at me and my dog. It was tall and thin, with its horns, red eyes, long talons, and a big grin it looked terrifying. I had never froze seeing the paranormal. While I made a note about it, I always told myself if I leave it alone, it will leave me alone. I just kept staring at it, not being able to move or make a sound. Holly kept snarling. The thing's smile grew as I think it noticed I couldn't move. I started moving closer and closer. I laid there terrified as it raised its talons up like it was going to slash me. At that moment, Holly jumped off my bed to attack the thing. I heard her teeth snap close as the thing disappeared. 
She landed on the floor right by my bed. I could finally move, but Holly kept growling at the door. Holly didn't stop growling till an hour or two after the event. Holly sadly passed away due to being hit by a car a few months ago. She was stubborn and aggressive, but still a good dog who was brave enough to defend me from this thing, and I will always miss her. I haven't had sleep paralysis since or before this event, and hope it never happens again. I still feel the creature around me, especially in the dark. Ever since this event, any time around a dog, I feel the presence move away from me. I now have a service dog due to my PTSD. His name's Chance, and he's a giant German Shepherd mix who stands over two feet at the shoulders. Since having Chance with me everywhere, the thing keeps away from me. I want to get rid of this thing. Maybe one day I will, but till then, I hope to never have that close of an encounter again. Stay safe out there. You never know if there's something out there that you can't see. The Let's Read Podcast is brought to you by Wix, your one-stop shop when creating your very own custom website for your business or interests. I've been wanting to create a website for my podcast and YouTube channel for some time where I can aggregate all of my utilities in one website, and Wix is helping me accomplish this. As I'm developing my website, some of the coolest features of the site include the most technologically advanced website building platform available in that Wix code is creation without limits. You can build a professional website any way you want, use sophisticated technology to build advanced web applications, build robust websites and web apps, set up databases and content-rich sites without coding, collect and store content and user info, use Wix code APIs and JavaScript to control your site's functionality, no HTML or CSS necessary, create dynamic pages, set up a single design style, create hundreds of pages and update content in a click. Easily create application forms, quizzes, review sections, and more. Used to collect user info, everything is SEO compatible, which is amazing. Start with a blank slate and design your website in any layout you want. Push the limits of web design. Built to look beautiful, intuitive to use. Advanced features to look stunning, set the image quality and sharpness of your photos. You have a true sense of freedom in that you can create your design to your lifestyle. Add advanced design features like video backgrounds, image galleries. This powerful all-in-one platform includes unlimited fonts, design effects, HD videos, grids and layouts, code capabilities, and media galleries. Get an all-in-one business solution to grow your online presence. As millions of businesses begin to use Wix to create their websites, you can instantly connect your customers, manage all interactions in one place, use advanced business features, automate your work, boost productivity, built-in task management and reminder tools, manage your workflow and meet your deadlines, add chat to send real-time messages, build customer relationships, create and send pricing options to users, start taking payments online, and set up multiple payment options. Use advanced design features to tell your story online. Build your site with artificial intelligence that actually kind of pulls together all the particular things you have in your different social media websites, such as my example would be YouTube and Twitter and Instagram, and it kind of pulls it all together to create a very customized website specific to you, which has been incredibly helpful so far when getting started. Uh, get complete personalization of your site, use actionable analytics to solve, you know, any sort of IT problems you have, uh, voice recognition capabilities, and chatbots, which is pretty amazing. Now, all of this is something that I'm in the process of building and learning as I go along with Wix, which is amazing because they're really making it incredibly easy. Now, if this sounds like something that you would be interested in getting involved in, you can get started now by going to Wix.com. That's W-I-X dot com slash podcast to get 10% off. Wix.com slash podcast.